Well, hopefully you found that video interesting and a good analogy of what it means to be able to give consent, even if you initially said yes, even if um, you know you consent to, to certain aspects of behavior, um, you're allowed to withdraw consent as the behavior continues. And uh, that's true for either member of the, of the couple um, to be able to say, you know what, this is as far as I wanted to go. I'm done and to be free of coercion, pressure, force, co anything like that. All right, so our next category of rape is the category called statutory rape. And this is when the, vi the victim can't give consent. And this is, a, it's called statutory because it is um, defined by the law. It's not like the first two categories where on the face of it, it's clear that this is a person who didn't give consent, even though they could have and that they didn't want it, this and there might have been other stuff involved. With statutory rape, you may have a victim who doesn't see themselves as a victim. They may have agreed to the behavior. They may have invited the behavior. Um, but the law says that they are not eligible to give their consent. So normally in class, I like to ask students to um, name the three situations in which a person is not legally allowed to give their consent. And usually students do a pretty good job of mentioning age as one of the categories. Um, so if you're below whatever the state has decided is the legal limit for a person to be able to give consent to sexual activity. Um, but there are other categories as well. So let's go ahead and talk about those. So we've got age, and then we've got two types of diminished capacity. Um, you can have temporary diminished capacity due to some kind of intoxicant, like alcohol or drugs. Um, and it's considered temporary because of course, once that intoxicant is gone, now you're back to a, an adult who can make decisions for yourself. But while under the influence of intoxicants, you cannot give consent. This is a gray area, kind of an, uh, a tricky area with acquaintance rape. When you have two people who have both used intoxicants, um, neither one technically can give consent to sexual behavior, but oftentimes the, uh, the diminished capacity is seen as greater for the person who is penetrated. So if the person is um, the penetrator, so usually that's going to be male, um, they oftentimes are the ones who are, are accused of statutory rape due to intoxicants, even if they're under the influence of intoxicants themselves. Um, the other diminished capacity is a permanent one where the person has an IQ below 70. Some states name it as um, having a, a, an age equivalent, a mental age of 12. Um, one way or another, you have a person who hasn't got um, you know, enough mental functioning to be able to give their consent. Some people who are above that level as an adult, they had normal levels of intelligence when they were an adult. And then as they got older, they developed dementia, may move into this kind of dim diminished ca capacity category and would be unable to give consent. Um, so age and or some kind of diminished capacity. Now, I thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about the age issue because Washington State has uh, the age of consent at 16. Some states, it's 18. Other states are even younger. Um, but 16 is ours. But here's, it's actually a lot more complex than that it looks at first. So if a person who is 11 years old um, engages in sexual contact with somebody who is less than or equal to two years older than them. And they literally count this out in months and weeks. So if a person is ex on their 11th birthday, they could have sexual activity with somebody on their 13th birthday, right? Like they both are exactly two years apart. Um, but 13 and one week, suddenly we've got statutory rape. So an 11 year old can have contact with somebody who's within two years of their own age. 12 and 13 year olds can engage in sexual contact with somebody who's within three years of their own age. And um, if a person is more than that, in either of these two categories, they can be sentenced to life in prison. So imagine that if you have an 11 year old and a person who is 13 years, one week, 
they are technically eligible for life in prison as their punishment for having sexual contact with an 11 year old. Um, so it's a lot of people say the safest thing to say is just not until anybody's 18. But you know, in real practicality, um, a lot of times things go on when we are adolescent and you know, people who are older than us are in, interested in us and things like that. And so um, it is really serious business to be engaging with somebody who is 11, 12, or 13. That's for sure. Now, 14 or 15 can consent to somebody who's up, up to four years older than them. So that's, you know, a 14-year-old could engage with somebody who's up to 18. A 15-year-old could engage with somebody who is up to 19. Um, and that's um, and that's it. So like a 21-year-old and a 15-year-old, we're looking at uh, up to five years in prison. So if you're more than four years older than a 14 or 15-year-old, um, you could get up to five years in prison for sexual contact with them. Once you're at 16, you're at the age of consent and um, you could not have statutory rape um, charges. Now we see this sometimes though in the state of Washington where parents of a 16-year-old, usually it's a girl, will find out about her 21-year-old boyfriend or something like that and um, want him charged with statutory rape. And it's a, it's a, a murky line. Um, sometimes they've been successful and sometimes they have not been successful. And so um, probably the, the best rule for a person who's older is to look at that 18-year-old cutoff point because 18-year-olds can consent to anyone. Um, so 18 is like the for sure. Even though our age of consent in Washington is 16, 18 is for sure. Aggravated rape would be any of these categories I've described so far, plus four sex acts by threat of death or serious bodily injury, forced sex acts involving an unconscious or drugged victim, or sex acts with children under the age of 12. And this, um, when I, I have this listed separately over here, because I had been talking about just in Washington over there in the green box. Here I'm talking about in, um, when we talk about rape in general. So not just Washington state law. We call it aggravated rape. If you have any of the other kinds of rape, plus these additional things that make it even worse than um, what we had been talking about. So it tacks on extra criminality to it or um, harm that the, that the victim might in, uh, endure. All right. So let's start with some rape myths. I feel like it's a little bit easier to talk about rape if we talk about things that people sometimes believe that are not true, right? So here's an article from um, 2011, um, and you see that charming title, no means yes, yes means anal, um, and that f the frat who actually said that got banned from Yale, so um, yeah. Um, there are people who think that rape happens because women somehow encourage it, right? that the way that they dress or the way that they dance or the way that they flirt or the fact that they went to somebody's apartment or the fact that they are the only girl in a group of boys or basically by existing, they are encouraging rape. Like every behavior that they're doing is actually an encouragement. And there are people who actually believe that, that, that women are asking for it. Um, it's, you, I would like to think that this is an old fashioned idea, but I was just watching a TV show. I'm making this recording in November of 2020 and I was just watching a TV show called Crimes Gone Viral and it is exactly what it sounds like. It's something that you've probably seen on a viral video and then they spend 15 minutes discussing like the context surrounding it and stuff. And uh, one of the crimes was caught on tape in a bar where the cocktail waitress was um, entering uh, an order into the ca into the cash register and a customer went by and just grabbed her butt like really thoroughly. And so she grabbed him, got him in a headlock, threw him to the ground, called the police and he ended up getting 11 months of community service for this um, sexual assault on her. And a bunch of people on social media were saying, good for her, way to go, way to stand up for yourself. And then a bunch of people were saying, what did she expect given that she was wearing short shorts and a crop top and things like that. Um, and this was a video from 2019. People still want to attribute these kinds of behaviors to women somehow encouraging it or eliciting those behaviors. 
Um, there's no reason why a person wearing a mini skirt and a crop top should assume that they are going to be groped or attacked or something. Um, another common myth is that uh, really the rapist, it's really tied to this women encouraging rape. You know, look at these clothing that they're wearing or whatever. And oh, I'm just so turned on. I just have lost control over my sexual urges. And I just have to, you know, hump whoever's here, right? Like, that's kind of the assumption. And that is not at all what rape is about. It's not about sexual urges, for one thing. Um, we're going to talk about that in more detail. But for most, um, in almost every situation of, of rape, including a, acquaintance rape, um, it, there's a certain quality of you owe it to me, even in an acquaintance rape. You know, I, all the behaviors that you've engaged in up till, the, till this point led me to believe that this was going somewhere and now you can't back out. It's not about because I'm so aroused, it's because you're here and you owe it to me. It's more of a dominance thing. Um, rapists do not lose control over their sexual urges. They lose control over their um, ability to be um, empathetic. They um, want to harm the other person, either degrade them or physically harm them. It's not about sexual urges. How about the idea that women secretly want to be raped? This one really is perplexing and really sticks around. Um, the idea that, you know, somehow women feel like they have to pretend like they aren't into it. And so you have to really convince, cajole, coerce, and maybe even force um, because they're just pretending like they aren't really into it. There are a lot of people who think that no means try harder. And so imagine if you're from this frat at Yale, no doesn't mean no, no means yes. And then yes means anal, right? Like, so if she says no, that means that she really wants to. And if she says yes, that means she really wants to. She's into all the things, right? Um, that's not what women mean when they say no. Um, usually when women say no, they mean no. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, I've had men in class say to me, you know, who believes this stuff? Well, that's why I had to pull up this, this frat thing. And yeah, I'll grant you this is nine years ago, but I'm going to guess it's, it's happened in the subsequent years, but hasn't made it to the news. Um, because this is part of like, sort of, um, like male group talk about, you know, what, females really mean and what they want and how they react and things like that. And it's one of those myths that develops because people talk about it. Um, so um, where am I? There we go. What about another aspect of women secretly wanting to be raped? And that's uh, the research that Kinsey reported where women were saying things about their fantasies being oftentimes sort of like rape fantasies, seeming seemingly to probably to a, a man's ear in particular it sounds like they have rape fantasies when in fact what if you look at the um the first person accounts that the women provided they weren't talking about wanting to be raped in any of the ways that i described or defined earlier they're talking about what's going on in this dolce and, and gabbana ad where you know she's just so desirable and you know all of the men are are interested in her and but she's really in in charge and uh, but they're just so overwhelmed with their passion for her and stuff like that. And so that kind of wanting to be desired and that kind of wanting to, you know, you're still in control of the situation as the female, but that you want to be desirable and desired is not the same thing as a true rape fantasy. Um, and I, it, I think it was very harmful after Kinsey reported that, that we spent another like 70 years having to fight back the, the premise that women actually wanted to be physically raped. Um, here's an interesting study where they um, looked at, they looked at a bunch of different studies across, um, you know, a lot of different contexts. And one of the things that they found is that um, there, there's a difference in um, whether the victim labeled their encounter, their experience as a rape or not. They called the people who did not call it a rape, they called those non-labelers, and they called those who labeled it rape, they called them labelers. So you see the two headers for them. 
And if you look at the under the M um, column, so on our first row, it says benevolent sexism toward men. You see the M is 1.99 for the non-labelers, and it's 1.41 for the labelers. So what we're looking at in this table is comparisons between that M under the non-labelers versus that M under the labelers. The M is the average score that the person gave um, on, you know, the what their, how much they accepted um, the the rape myth. And so here we have the only differences that emerged were between the people who held a benevolent sexism toward men, where they think of men as um, sort of as a group having certain characteristics and um, that those characteristics are beneficial or um, should be protected or they're desirable. Um, and then we also see a difference in the, between the two groups when when the person holds a benevolent sexism towards women, where again, they have stereotyped views of women, but they are positive ones that they like. Um, there was no difference in the labeling if the person had hostile sexism towards men or towards women. Um, and then the female rape ac myth acceptance, there's no difference on how the degree of, of that and whether the person labeled their experience as sex as um, rape or not. And then tolerance of sexual harassment didn't predict whether they labeled their experience as um, rape or not. So what we see is that um, holding stereotypes, right? And it, in fact, benevolent stereotypes, right? So women have these behaviors and that's a stereotype, right? I'm just like, these. this is how women are. And so this pr woman who's in front of me must be like that. That, that would be a benevolence. Uh, that would be a stereotype. And if the thing I'm saying that they must be is a compliment um, or it's something that I want to protect about them, that'd be considered be benevolent. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at this individual member of that sex as just a, an example of all males or females, and you think that their characteristics must be positive because of that group that they belong to. So it's kind of the opposite of what the researchers had expected. They kind of had thought that um, labelers would be more likely to, um, you know, display hostile sexism. They thought that hostility towards the other sex would be the important factor, but it turns out actually having benevolent sexist attitudes um, is a better predictor of whether you label the interaction as rape or not. Um, so the idea that I'm trying to drive home is that we've got, um, you know, sort of these assumptions about people and that can lead to whether we think that the activity that we just engaged in whatever just happened to me as a victim or what I just did as the, um, as the perpetrator, we kind of label what just happened through our lens of these stereotypes of the other sex. Um, another ma rape myth is that women can resist. You know, if they really didn't want it, they would fight the guy off. And I just thought I'd share a couple of things with you. Um, first off, if we look at the most frequent aged victim, the the age group that is most likely to be the victim of rape, it's a 12 to 17 year old. And so we're looking at, um, and then, you know, really the next, if we, if we sum up the, the, the three highest ranking ages, it's somebody who's 24 or less. And so we're looking at a person who is, um, you know, probably not fully reached their maximum strength anyway, let alone the fact that as a female, they have less upper body strength on average than a male and things like that anyway. But we're looking at on average younger women who maybe aren't at their max capacity yet. Um, so if they wanted to resist, they may not have developed that strength yet. Um, and they may not have developed the confidence that they need to know when a, a situation is going south or, or something. Um, so I would like to point out some things that make it really difficult for women to resist based on given that they might be in, you know, they're, they, they might be in a situation that maybe they are not, they haven't tuned in too quickly enough that it's dangerous, that they may not be their maximum strength yet. And they also may display what's called tonic immobility. That's the um, fear freeze response that victims of all sorts of stuff just, you know, they explain that, you know, people who get hit by cars, they oftentimes, you know, the onlookers will be like, you know, why didn't you jump out of the way? Well, because I saw a car barreling towards me and 
I wanted to jump, but my, my actual muscles were immobile. My brain is yelling jump and my body couldn't because my, my whole body was immobile. Well, it's, it's called the fear freeze response. You see it in prey animals when they see a predator, they freeze. The, the purpose when it's a prey animal is if I freeze, maybe the predator can't see me anymore, right? Because predators really depend on motion to help them see the, 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 pre, the prey. So tonic immobility works really well in that situation, right? But if you're supposed to be jumping out of a, an oncoming car's path, or if somebody has grabbed you, tonic immobility may actually make it more likely that, you know, you can, you can be victimized, right? You can be harmed. Um, so we got to give credit to the victim for the possibility that they wanted to fight back, but the truth is they couldn't because their body was immobile. I'd also like to point out that research shows that resistance re does reduce the likelihood of rape, but it actually increases the likelihood of injury. So um, I thought I'd share that little tidbit with you that, you know, on this big meta analysis of um, the effect of victim resistance on rape completion, um, you may avoid becoming raped, but you may end up with physical damage that is um, sometimes life threatening. So um, resistance sometimes is not the best plan if the goal is to actually get out of this alive or to get out of this without any long-term physical harm. Self-defense training does improve the odds of avoiding a sexual assault and or injury. And I have my citation here at the bottom of that. Um, so one of the biggest things that self-defense training does is teaches people how to make sure that they're not in um, situations where the stranger assault types are likely to happen you know, staying away from the bushes while you're walking out to your car. Don't walk past, um, you know, alcoves where the doorway might be and somebody could hide behind. You know, it gives you really good information about how to, how to be situationally aware and how to make sure that you're not in a situation where the stranger attack might occur. With regard to, um, you know, the, the acquaintance type of, of rape, we're talking about situations where it's a lot more ambiguous. And so you are in a situation because you trust this person. And then when the situation starts to turn, you're still hoping that this is the person that you trust and that you'd be able to say, no, I don't want to. And um, no, stop. I, I, I don't want to. And so a lot of times the self-defense training doesn't help as much in those situations as it might for, you know, this, the, the kind of blitz sexual assault that we would be talking about with a stranger rape. Um, how about this rape myth that women falsely accuse? You know, anytime there is a, a purported victim who is revealed to have made up the story, it makes the cover of the news, right? It's on the, it's on the TV, it's on the internet. Everybody talks about those few cases where women falsely accuse. And then they say, well, the exception proves the rule, right? Women falsely accuse. It turns out that only 5% of rape allegations prove to be false after investigation. So that means that 95% of the rape allegations do not turn out to be false. Um, when rep uh, women report, one, another myth is that if they truly are a victim, they'll be emotional while they're telling the story of what happened. And this is a really profoundly deep assumption that people have that if you've been victimized while you tell the story you'll be crying you'll be you know sad you'll be all these signs that would let other people know that what what you're saying is an emotional story and things like that um, but the truth is that um, a, there's a wide range of demeanors that a victim might display um, some are crying some are in shock. And so they tell the story as if they're disembodied from the story. Um, some, you know, some of them will just give all the facts one after the next and not really seem like they're, they lived through it. it. It may seem like they're just sort of telling a story, but the truth is that's sort of how their brain is separating out the information. I need to tell my story and I need to not break down right now. Um, some women literally can't believe what just happened to them. Some victims, um, some men can't believe what just happened to them. And so they, um, they're in sort of an astonishment state rather than even shock. They, they, 
they do feel like I just watched a movie like that that has to have happened to someone else so there are a lot of different ways that a person might respond and expecting a truthful uh you know report to be accompanied by tears and things like that has caused a lot of women to be um to for example re retract their report because they feel like no one's believing them even though it was a true report um, because they weren't acting the way that the interviewers expected them to um, they can tell they're not being believed and sometimes it's just through the demeanor of the interviewer and sometimes it's they will overtly say i don't believe you um, and imagine if you've already been victimized and you are telling the truth but you're being outright told, I don't believe what you're saying to me. Um, so sometimes victims will retract their report because they feel like the system is, you know, harming them all over again. Now in this study by, uh, the, in this meta-analysis um, that was conducted by, um, well, I don't know how to pronounce that person's first name, <laughs> Nitschke um, et al. They looked at all sorts of different studies of, um, you know, believing a woman's report. Um, and it didn't matter whether the observers were police in the study or the observers were college students in the story or if or in the study, or if uh, the observers were community members, just regular everyday people um, participating in, in the study. Um, you know, when they see the, the, the uh, victim um, telling their story, all of them, seem to expect the victim to cry that that provides more credibility in the minds of of police of college students and community members alike and it's a it, it is a myth we, not all women will respond like that now i've already addressed the issue of most rapes being committed by strangers that's obviously um, not true but i thought i'd break down a little bit more um you know how the how the acquaintance might pan out so on the far left is stranger rapes. And so that that's um, not the part we're interested in. So let's look at the um, the remaining bars. And so the, the yellow bars are when you've got um, a drug or alcohol facilitated rape. So that maybe, um, you know, you've got a little bit of that statutory component to it where the person maybe just can't consent. And then you've got the blue where it's, uh, the blue bars are where the, the person's like a literal forcible rape. And so you see um, husband or ex-husband is on the, you know, right there next to stranger. Father or stepfather is next. Boyfriend is next. Other relative. And you'll notice that other relative has, uh, other relative, husband or ex-husband, father or stepfather. Forcible is the most common type of rape in those situations. So when it's sort of a relative or an actual relative, Force is oftentimes involved. With boyfriend, it's drug or alcohol facilitated rape and forcible rape almost equally. Um, when we get to friend, you'll notice drug or alcohol facilitated rape is much more common. And also with classmates. Uh, now, classmate is, is the rarest in, the, um, in this chart, but you know it's three times more likely to be drug or alcohol facilitated. And then other non-relative, uh, it's almost equal to be drug and alcohol facilitated or forcible. Um, so you'll notice there's lots of different acquaintances on this list. And so I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, illustrate that it could be somebody who you're related to that's your acquaintance. It could be somebody who you know kind of a little bit, like a classmate, or it could be somebody who, you know, you're intimately involved with. Um, that would be the acquaintance. And then different strategies that's you that are used by the attacker. All right, another rape myth is that all men are capable of rape. And this is probably the most damaging of these myths, right? Because it kind of labels all men as potential predators. Um, very few men are ca capable of rape. Um, it's more likely that a man would be capable of rape if he has one or more of these contributors present. One is, um, you know, sex role se socialization, that they've been raised in a circumstance that gives them the impression that men are entitled to what they want and um, you know women are objects things like that um, if they really adhere to, to rape myths right if they really all these things that we've been going through if they if if you have a man who really believes these myths are true it's more likely that he'll see women as objects and see women as as um, you know people who can just be uh, victimized 
if they're in a circumstance where really there aren't many sanctions for these kinds of behaviors, right? If they know that there's really nothing going to happen to them anyway, um, they may be more likely to act on these impulses. And you see this in different cultures where rape is not even really a crime very much. They, uh, you see it happening much more often and, and hardly ever reported and things like that. Um, if you have a, a man who belongs to a group where the peers really support these sort of callous attitudes towards women and um, you know these rape myths, it's much more likely that um, an individual man might act on, on these behaviors. Um, pornography can contribute. There are certain kinds of pornography that are much more likely to contribute. The kind of pornography that contains um, violent acts um, acts where the woman is being restrained and acting like she likes it, things like that can give the impression that this is normal and this is how women would react if you tied them up or this is how a woman would, would react if you like forced her into something she didn't want to do. She'll ultimately like it. Um, things like that. Adversarial sexual beliefs where, you know, men see women as, you know, the enemy or that women don't really, you know, like men or that they're always trying to take advantage of men or that women are um, conniving and, you know, those kinds of things. These kinds of adversarial sexual beliefs make it more, more likely. Being a kind of person who just in general lacks empathy, you know, to be able to victimize someone else in, in any way really um, re requires a certain level of sort of callousness right? Not being able to put yourself in the other person's position, not being able to feel what somebody else feels. Um, so a lack of empathy. So some people, males and females, some people have less empathy for others. And those people are more likely to become rapists. And then belonging to all male membership groups, you know, fraternities are forever getting in trouble on college campuses for having, um, you know, acquaintance rapes and other kinds of, you know, gang rapes and other kinds of things that happen at their parties. Um, sports teams, oftentimes, you know, you've heard of locker room talk, right? A lot of times it's posturing, but other times, you know, you have people who might be actually internalizing the messages that are being shared in the locker room and they may actually develop sort of these, um, these rape myths, these beliefs that, that, you know, it's okay for men to do these behaviors because, you know, women really want them anyway and, and things like that. So all men are not capable of rape. Certain circumstances will typically take a person who maybe already is a little bit um, like unempathetic or something and move them in the direction of thinking that these behaviors are okay. Um, uh, I just want to emphasize though that for a lot of men, the acquaintance rape type is more impulsive than all the things I've been saying implies um, that they sometimes will engage in, um, you know, sort of forceful behavior or coercive behavior um, that isn't the kind, I'm not talking about the kind where they're like holding the, the, the victim down and, and um, you know, hurting them, but actually, you know, cajoling and, and coercing and stuff like that because they literally think that they're playing the dance, that they're going with the, you know, well, I'm supposed to say this and you're supposed to say that. And this is all part of the dance of, you know, seduction or something. And they really are tone deaf and not picking up the, the hints. Sometimes that happens. Um, so I'm talking about sexual violence where we're talking about a person who actually harms um, their victims in, in this list of things that tend to contribute to it. But all male membership groups and male peer support really can, can contribute to looking at women as objects. That's part of that sexual so socialization um, and makes people more likely to adhere to rape myths. So, um, yeah. All right, let's go ahead and stop here and we will shift gears in the next segment. We'll talk about child sexual abuse. <laughs> 